calling another world this way. <laughs> Hello? Hi, is this Merch? It is. Yeah, all right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our first guest this evening. He is a foremost expert on the Ouija board and a huge collector and also is in relation with the new film Ouija from Universal Pictures coming out on DVD and Blu-ray. We are very excited to welcome Merch to the show. Welcome, you're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me. I'm psyched to be here. We've been kind of talking between us. Did we actually pronounce the name of the board correctly? Because there's a couple of ways you can say it. (laughs) There is. So uh, originally, back in 1890, uh, the board, when it named itself, it was Ouija, Uh right? But by 1920, when people were playing it, they would say that they were ouija and then it became shortened to Ouija. So the manufacturers saw that really quickly, that people were calling it both, and so on the back of the box became Ouija or Ouija. Fantastic. Oh, so, so both is right. I, I've got to ask you, we, we were very upset with ourselves we couldn't make the event on Thursday. Uh, tell people what you guys did. You had a little fun down in Hollywood. How did it go? It was a lot of fun. So uh, I, I had consulted in the early days of the film, um, starting back in 2009, and uh, Universal asked me to be on the DVD, on the extra section. So um, you know, I talked a little bit about the history. And for the launch, they invited me to come up and do some fun stuff, which we did. We had a uh, Ouija hunt, so there was a scavenger hunt on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, my team came in third out of fourth, so <laughs> that wasn't great, but um, afterwards what we did was we had seances and interviews. So I took people uh, five at a time through the main, re- main ways that people believe the Ouija board works, and then we would actually try some psychic experiments where I, we would have pre-made cards that would have numbers, colors, countries, um, continents written on them. And someone had them, and I didn't see them. And they would put the card underneath and tell us what the topic was. And then we would ask Ouija what the answer was. It was pretty cool. And what's the perhaps weirdest thing that happened during the night? I mean, was it pretty close all the time, most of the time, some of the time? Well, the... It was actually no. We we had we just had a bad night. Like I, as far as I know, it did not nail any of the answers. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, the weirdest thing that happened to me was that this hobby and passion of um, twenty years for me that I you know go all around trying to research the Ouija board uh, ended me up in L.A. So that was pretty weird for me. Yeah, see, you got you got to know that merch. It's like working with animals. Sometimes they have a bad night and they don't work on cue. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the spirits just don't want to do anything. I understand. Now, I can totally understand why Universal brought you on board, because they naturally want to bring some legitimacy to what is a a, a fictional script. Uh, But from somebody that takes this stuff really seriously now, before we get into the real world of what it's all about, what genuinely did you think about the film? I thought it was a very good film. Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. So... Let me go back just a little bit really quick. So I, um, 2009, I came home from a party and uh, was watching television and saw an interview with Brian Goldner, who is the CEO of Hasbro. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how Ouija was just an untapped brand. It was just so recognizable. You don't need to promote it. Everyone knows how it works. Mm -hmm. And yet, nothing. There's nothing really going on. He wanted to do a movie. And so I, um, I figured out his email address because back in those days it was, there was a couple of different ways to do it. I sent three emails out, two of them bounced back and one of them came through. And within a couple of hours, he had written back and put me in touch with Bennett Schneer, who was the head of Hasbro Entertainment in LA, the film division. And, um, we started talking and we talked for many years through many different scripts, many different directors, lots of different ideas. And, uh, you know, I gave him, what I know uh, about how people feel about the Ouija board and how that's changed over time. So we have Ouija stations, don't play it alone, always say goodbye, all lots of different things that people believe about the Ouija board. And then uh, I was really excited when they got the green light and then they picked um, Styles White and uh, Juliet Snowden. Great. They did a great job writing and and, um, Styles did an amazing job directing. And of course, Blumhouse Productions, Jason Blum, just, you know, they put together a winning team. And so, if you look at what I think about the movie, 
my biggest fear as a historian has always been where does the Ouija board have a place in this digital world? Mm -hmm. in, a, in a time where kids are playing every digital game in the world, are they going to pick up a board game that their great great grandparents used to play? Mm -hmm. And so the movie success for me was a big deal, not whether I agreed or how it was portrayed or what I liked, but just could they manage to bring a new generation to the board? And they did. So to me, it's amazing. Very good. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, I mean, there are so many people that have varying opinions, um, and we'll kind of get into how you got interested in the Ouija board, but, you know, what is your personal opinion of of it? Is it's, A lot of people say, oh, it's just a game, it's just a board game, it's no big deal. There's other people that are saying, you know, for no amount of love or money would I ever touch one. Do you think it's real? Is it really a conduit, or is it a game? It's definitely a conduit, meaning something definitely opens up when you play it. So we'll start there, right? There's three biggest, most popular ways that people believe the Ouija board works. The first is idiomotor motor response, and that's what psychologists believe is happening when you play the Ouija board. Mm -hmm. So if you take your hands and you put them in front of you, you notice they, they move a little bit. Some people shake a little more than others. Our hands are made of muscles, and they don't want to stay still. You remember when you were a little kid, and you got in trouble and you had to stay on that line and they're like, stay still. And you found yourself kind of swaying. You're like, mm -hmm. wow, that's really tough. Right. Um, we just we don't want to stay still. And your subconscious does an amazing thing. It blocks and filters out all the crap and all the stuff that's coming at you so you can focus on having a conversation like we're having. But your subconscious takes everything in it. It takes everything. All the colors, all the movements, everything. So it's all going in but your conscious mind doesn't see any of that. Now, when you use a Ouija board, uh, a psychologist believes that those small movements in your hands get married with your subconscious, and so you're pushing the planchette. You're answering the questions, but you don't know it. And so it's kind of a, a mind trick that happens. Now, psychics believe that what might be happening is a form of telepathy, that the door that's opening up is to each other. So you're starting to read each other's minds, and that's what's going on. And then there's the age-old belief that you are opening up the door to the other side and that something other than the people who are playing the board are talking back to you. So communication is happening between you and something else, something outside. And I've used the Ouija board at this point hundreds, thousands of times. I've definitely seen idiomotor motor response in action. I, I felt like, wow, could this be some form of telepathy? And then there are those much smaller times where I think, are we talking to something else? And, and, and that's the beauty of this game, that the Ouija board turns 125 in April, and we're still playing it. And you know because, the... Go ahead, you know, sorry. Just, just, just for that small chance, right. it might work. Right. The thing that, that boggles my mind, I, I was born in 1956, and I was given boards all the way through my childhood, and, and well, first of all, I can't believe some of the things our parents gave us, because, <laughs> <laughs> like the thing maker that could kill you and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, the, it was dangerous stuff. But what boggles my mind is, is not only is it still popular today, but toy companies worry a lot more about their image today mm -hmm. than they did back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't care what they could give the kid a gun, it's okay. <laughs> but now they worry about it, everybody's so politically correct. Hasbro really isn't worried about the so-called demonic possibility or image it might present, is it? And isn't that a little strange well, to you? Well, no. Hopefully, um, Hasbro knows something I've been telling them for a long time, which is Ouija boards have been sold continuously in toy stores for 125 years now. Now, why is that and how is that possible, right? You have to go back and think, the Ouija board has not changed. Talking boards first start in Ohio in 1886, clearly born out of the spiritualist movement used by people to talk to spirits. Ouija is named and born in Baltimore in 1890. So it's a brand owned by Hasbro. And it's one of many different talking boards. It's just the most popular and the only one that's lived as long as it has. Now, the thing is, it hasn't changed. The purpose has always been the same. However, our comfort level with death has changed. Today, we don't want to die. We do everything we can not to. We eat better. 
we take supplements, we go to the gym, we go to the doctor, we don't even want to look old, we go to the um, plastic surgeon, we do anything we can not to get there. But if you go back to the 1800s and you come off of the Civil War, massive death in the country. Unlike anything we've ever seen, everyone lost a father, a son, a brother, a cousin, a grandfather. And these people went away to war and they just didn't come back. So not only do you have to deal with that massive death, but you have the question of what happened to them because no one sent you a letter. No one knew who some of these people were. Just gone. So imagine living in a life where those things can happen. It's hard for us because we have 24-7 media. Something happens in Saudi Arabia. We hear about it 30 seconds later. Right. But things happen in the world you, just, you never know. And also, think of mortality rate. So you have 12 children and six of them die. And you, when those children die, you take pictures of your live children with your dead children and you put that on the wall to remember them. Right. Death is so pervasive in your life and loss is just so much more than you gain that it is not strange that you would sit around trying to talk to the dead because death is just overwhelming in your world. Not like today. Today we don't want children going to funerals. We keep things from them. We, we let children be children. Back then, by eight years old, your kid was working. Yeah. It's just you, your child was a small adult, not a kid. You know. So um, the real thing that's changed is us and our perception and comfort level with death. But what hasn't changed is that we're still fascinated and scared by it, and we want to know that potentially for 1995, you can get an unlimited unco calling plan to the other side, no roaming, no overages. <laughs> potentially, it works. Mm -hmm. Because if it works, it means your life is not insignificant. If there is something after this, the short time we spend here meant something. Right. And so, you know, think of this, like, it, it's just, it's hard to think, and as we get older, we all experience this more. We lose someone suddenly. You never got to say goodbye. Maybe you got into a fight with that person before they got in the car, and you never got to apologize, but just tell them you were having a horrible day, and that's why you were in such a bad mood. You know, or maybe that person just meant so much to you, you never really thought about your life without them, and you need closure. And so those things that haven't changed from 1890. It doesn't matter if we're comfortable with it. Death is the great equalizer. It happens to all of us. It's going to happen to all of us. And so our fascination and this kind of uncomfortableness with death still exists. What and, you um, said is so true. Like the mm -hmm. thing that really creeped me out uh, that I discovered on the internet lately is there used to be a whole type of photography back in, in, in like, I think it was 1800s or something, uh, beginnings of photography, to where they had special photographers that would pose your deceased person with you. They had mm -hmm. stands they made to prop them up to take family photos. And you would not do that today. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because, again, you know, again, we're uncomfortable with that. You used to, when you laid out your person that died, they were laid out in your house, in yeah. your parlor. And that was an honor. That was respect. That was to show how much you loved them, that they were shown in your house. Today, uh, no thank you. You know, like, uh, we have funeral parlors for that. Right. And so, again, our, our just comfort level has changed with it. But our fascination hasn't. And so the Ouija board constantly gets picked up and rediscovered by every generation. And like I said, what was great, and, you know, I told this to, you know, Styles, no pressure, but whether your movie succe succeeds or not does something interesting to the Ouija board. Either you bring it into this generation or it's figuratively another nail in its coffin. Will it survive? And if you think of all of the spirit communication devices that have been made, none of them have had the pop culture success that the Ouija board has had. None of them have made that leap where everyone's got a Ouija board in their closet. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's a fascinating snapshot of American culture. 
Well, in talking about how important it has been in pop culture, which is very true, um, I wanted to ask your opinion of something that I thought was kind of funny because you're talking about how people, how humanity has changed so much over the years. And of course now uh, everything's digital, everything's online, everything's a computer or a video game and all this kind of stuff. But one of the reasons that they say that the Ouija board works, whether it's a, a, a portal to talk to spirits or whether it's the nerve endings in, in your fingers that are connecting with, you know, whatever, it, it was the physical manifestation of having the board. Now they have digital talking boards online mm -hmm. that are apps or their computer games uh do you really think that 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 a is going to have the mainstay of the original board and b do you think that there's any legitimacy to that possibly working how is it going to connect to the person when it's digital well so here we go like um casper the friendly ghost has never to my knowledge come down and given us the rule book to how ghosts work so we have a lot of theories <laughs> and there's a lot of you know, and there's tons of TV shows. You know, I, I've even been lucky enough to appear on a few of them that everyone's got a theory as to how it works. Oh, there's K2 meters that measure electromagnetic fields and, and, and ghosts can do that. Well, I don't know. I, again, I have no idea. I'm not dead, so I have no idea if that right. can affect it at all. Um, and so if a Ouija board can work, if spirit communication is possible and you can do it through a Ouija port, why not through a computer? I mean, there's electricity in there, and there's all kinds of there's electromagnetic fields in there. All this stuff is in there. Okay, you know, sure, if I'm going to make the leap that I can talk to someone dead, how can I say it's ridiculous to do it through a board game, you know, or, like, it's cool to do it through a board game, but it's ridiculous through a computer. Right. I, just, I can't say that. <laughs> you know, like, I, I'm, like, you know, ma I'm making things up. So, um, you know, I don't think it, it doesn't work the same in the sense that, Everyone who's used a talking board or a spirit board or a witch board, they know that what happens is very unique to that experience. Putting your hands on it, asking a question, and when it starts to move, it instantly goes quiet. And time slows down, and you hear that noise of the felt feet kind of moving on the board, and you're looking at your friends going, are you pushing it? I'm not pushing it. No, I'm not pushing it. And you don't know. It's really creepy. Um, feeling that, you know, you, you just can't understand what's happening. And, you know, it's possible your friends are pushing it. I've talked to many people who are like, oh, you know, older people in their 90s. Oh, God, we used to play all the time and we used to scare the crap out of my little sister. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, like it, it was, you know, it, it could be, but maybe it's not. And, and I think that's the real question is, what if it's not? What if you're really talking to something else? And, Ouija boards are often people's first experience with the paranormal. You, you know, you... Today, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you got to experience something firsthand that I thought was really cool. You got me all excited when you mentioned the spiritualist movement, because having been an old magician, I love that whole thing where Houdini and everybody was debunking all his uh, seances and psychics. Yeah. That was a big thing back then. You got to appear on Bullshit. Now I want to know. I want to know what happened Got at Penn and Teller. That was a great way to describe it. Yeah. What what happened is it's the yeah. one word that, that I don't care how censored you are, which we're not, by the way. You've got to say it. it's the name of the show. <laughs> but but how did Penn and Teller handle this, and and what did they really say to you? You know, it was an awesome experience. All of my I've been so lucky. You know, from bullshit to Ghost Adventures, uh, Smithsonian Channel. I've gotten a chance to do a million different things because of my work in this field. And Bullshit was uh, kind of my first big, you know, on television thing. Um, and they didn't tell us what it was about. So we're a first season. No one knows the show exists. <laughs> they say they want to do something on Ouija boards. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get my friends. We're going to get them involved. They live in Salem, the witch city. It's perfect. We make our own talking board called Critique. It's a spirit board from Salem. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, three weeks before it airs, we get a call. By the way, this is Penn and Teller's bullshit. And, um, we're, we're, we're basically going to break you over the coal. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. at first, I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, my God. No, I don't care what happens to me. I, I Luckily, my only part in there is uh, being a collector and maker of cryptic. And so I'm not uh, involved, really, in the whole seance or 
the people that are trying to contact him. But those are my friends. Like, I got my friends to do this, <laughs> and they look like, you know, whack jobs. Okay, they're, they are whack jobs. They're my friends. But, you know, the world didn't necessarily need to know that. And uh, so, the, you know, they do it. What was wonderful about that experience was it became a walking, talking commercial for Cryptique. And because of that episode, our spirit board got into Newbury Comics, Spencer Gifts, Toys R Us. Wow. Uh, I mean, we were giving the Ouija board a, a run for its money all because of Penn & Teller. So every time I've seen them since, every time I've talked to them, a big, huge thank you. <laughs> no problem with it. I loved it. it was so crazy. every time you run into them, do they yell out bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I, one thing I made them give me from that episode was the bullshit talking board, which <laughs> my friend um, Rick Streck from New Jersey, he's, an, he's another Ouija board collector, also a tattoo artist. Every time I visit with him, he puts that episode on. He just has to you know, <laughs> dig that in. So I did that. So he was after that board. So uh, a couple years ago, I gave him that board, and he proudly displays it on his wall for big bullshit talking board. Yeah. Now, I wanted to mention, I mean, you were talking about it in relation to bullshit, uh, but the uh, spirit board that you guys did, Cryptique, which is actually the official Salem spirit board, uh, is that still available? It's not. No, no, we stopped doing it in 2005 for a unique reason. It was doing a little too well. So uh, my husband and I, we both work in the finance field. Cryptique was just an extension of my hobby. We were doing this together as a business thing. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where it needed a full-time thing. It was just getting picked up by a lot of places. And, you know, again, the, the best, worst thing that can happen to you, you've got too much need for it. So, um, yeah, we just said, okay, we have to decide if one of us is going to quit a job and do this and you know all signs pointed to no so we didn't quit our jobs <laughs> and um, Cryptique had a very slow death it, it died in about 2005 2006 I think we stopped um, but you never know it could come back right you know, well, the dead I, never stays dead. <laughs> that's right. I, wa I wanted to ask you uh, so that you can tell our listeners because we do have a huge horror movie fan base. That oh, we got a horror fan us. right here. You used to watch movies with Grandma. That's what I was going to say. You have a very interesting reason why you got interested in the Ouija <laughs> and talking spirit boards. What was that reason? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, you know, anyone who's seen me today would not guess this. I was raised Orthodox Jew. Mm. Today, for your listeners who can't see me, I have a shaved head, I have earrings and tattoos. <laughs> so don't look like the poster child for <laughs> the little Jewish boy that I was. And um, I was raised, my parents got divorced when I was two, and we lived with my grandparents. My mom, you know, moved in with my brother and I, and uh, my grandmother was awesome and crazy and fun. And she loved horror movies. She loved Creature Double Feature. Uh, and she loved to do whatever my mom told us we couldn't do. <laughs> so she would say, you can't watch that. Absolutely not. My grandma was like, definitely. I would never do that. As soon as she would leave, click, TV would go on. Um, she took me to, um, in 1986, to see uh, Witchboard. And that movie changed my life. It set me off in an amazing direction. So for horror, your horror fans know this movie. It's a cult classic, mm -hmm. Kevin Tenney's Witchboard, and which the very first movie where a talking board, witch board, a spear board, a Ouija board, played the main character, and everything revolved around that. So that movie really bit me. Um, and then fast forward to college, I was uh, I went to school at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, three of my roommates decided to rush for fraternity. And I knew my personality, I knew myself pretty well even back then, that if I rushed for fraternity, I would not graduate college. It just was not going to happen. <laughs> that would be the end of my scholastic studies. So um, I figured, let them go to rush. I would um, be able to go to the parties if they get in, and then I could also study. Right. And one of the things in their rushing was a treasure hunt. They had to find an old Ouija board. And I had spent my whole life uh, with my dad, going antiquing, flea marketing. I'd seen a million of these. And so I uh, went home on the weekends to Boston and uh, hit the antique stores and flea markets. And when we were done, I had 10 different boards. And I thought, how are there 10 different Ouija boards? Isn't there only one Ouija board? So we're back in 1992, very early stages of the Internet. There's no real knowledge on the Internet, uh, just a lot of porn 
nothing's changed. <laughs> so, um, so what happens is uh, I have to go to a library. And, and so many of your listeners may be like, I don't even know what that word means. Right. But it's a place where there were a lot of old books and encyclopedias. Um, so a paper version of Wikipedia. And um, I had to open them up and look up Ouija. And, and every single one, whether it was Funk and Wagnalls, whether, um, you know, it, Britannica, it didn't matter. Every time I looked it up, it said the Ouija board came from somewhere else. And I thought, impossible. How can everyone have an experience with the Ouija board? How can everyone know what you're talking about? You never have to tell anyone how to use it. And we don't know where it comes from. And that set me off in a, a two-decade plus journey, traveling all over the world, uh, tracking down the descendants of the original people who were involved in its origination, and uh, making a lot of friends, and working on a lot of movies and TV shows, and it changed my life. And so, you know, a funny side story, while I was in L.A., I made it my goal to um, have lunch with Kevin Tenney. Mm -hmm. Now, many years ago, back in 1960, you know, I, I tried to contact him, write him, tell him, oh my God, this movie's changed my life. I'm sure, he, you know, these are not the kind of letters you want to hear from. Like, oh, you're a horror guy, and you've got fans that are obsessive, and, you know, these are people who put you in the freezer and <laughs> dismember you, and you don't want to... I'm thinking, this man's never going to have lunch with me. He's known me for a long time, but he's still my friend. Well, he's very daring. We had lunch. Um, I actually own the prop board from Witch Board 3, <laughs> and he signed it for me. Oh. So, so he signed it for me. It was. I was like, okay, so I've worked with a lot of people. I'm never starstruck. I was just the biggest goober at that lunch in the world. I'm like, oh my God, I'm living lunch with Kevin Tenney. It was hilarious. Like, I'm sure he thought it was great. I was a big goober. But he's a, he's a wonderful guy, and that was really nice for him to do. Well, you know, what you said is true, because so many people know about the you know a, a spirit board or a talking board or the Ouija board and and so many people know how to play it and stuff but nobody really has any idea where it came from I personally when I was doing research uh, for this show found out more from your websites than I had known ever and you actually have become kind of a family historian for the guy who's known as the godfather or the grandfather of the Ouija board yeah, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I think what happened was, if it, if anyone could have done what I did, it, it really, I'd love to say that I'm just, I'm so talented and so amazing that only I, you know, could do this. No, what happened was, is I'm uh, obsessive about things I want to know. And, uh, you know, I, I don't care how long it takes. So 20 years is no big deal for me if it helps me solve the puzzle. So um, finding who was originally there and then finding those descendants and then talking to them, you'd be amazed at how much stuff people keep. Like, you know, I don't keep a lot of crap. Not that's important, not about my family. You know, if someone said, hey, can you show me a picture of your great-grandfather? I'd be like, uh, I don't know if I know his name. <laughs> you know, like, so I, I'm, I'm hunting that down, understanding that the people probably aren't going to know anything. Not true. These families have kept a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, two years ago, I was able to definitively figure out how the Ouija board got its name and that the Ouija board we knew had a lot of fathers there were a lot of men involved in its origination but it turns out the Ouija board had a mother and I was able to track down her grandson who is still living who knew all of the stories that I had found out that's a pretty cool thing it is wow Definitely. Well, uh, and, and of course, the one person that I didn't know anything about, maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about him, is William Fold. Yeah, what I want to find out is that the people in the early days of this, I, I mean, did they just do this for fun, or did were did they worship the devil as like a sideline? Well, I mean, because also there there is a there's a lot of things that go back to the days of uh, mm -hmm. paganism that say that it was used as a divination tool as well. So there are a lot of stories now. And I'm going to blame this on, on Kevin Tenney, so I hope he's listening. I'd <laughs> love to take credit for this. Um, so he did an amazing thing, which was he did, his, he did his research, and at the time there were a lot of things that were said that we know now are not true, mm -hmm. that we've been able to disprove. But he took all of these stories and he wove them together and wrote a history of the Ouija board, saying that things like um, Pythagoras used these devices um, you know, in 540 B.C. and that they were used in ancient times. It's not true. Like, talking boards are an American invention, as we know today. That may change, but um, 1886 is really the line where talking boards looked, worked, and acted like a Ouija board. There was a movable piece on the top. 
you know, you you can say, okay, that's close to a pendulum board mm-hmm. where you know you hold the string. I don't count that. It's not the same thing. Like that's pendulum. This is talking board. So if if you break them apart and you say, no, no, it has to look and act and work like this, that's 1886. And no, people didn't didn't um, to talk to the dead was not the same thing as worshiping the devil. Um, and it, it's, that's all been blurred uh, by Hollywood and, and our own kind of un- uncomfortableness again with death and, and making things bad when we're uncomfortable or don't understand them. But, um, you know, no, the people just talked to the dead because there was so much death around them. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so the story I'll tell you really quick. So uh, Charles Kennard is the man who claimed, one of the men who claimed to invent the Ouija board. The other man was E.C. Resch. They both lived in Chestertown, Maryland. E.C. Resch was a coffin maker, a cabinet maker, an undertaker. Uh, he made musical instruments, extremely talented guy. Charles Kennard uh, was an amazing businessman. So he had a lot of different businessmen. He tried some things, they failed, some things worked. Um, according to Charles Kennard, one day in 1886, he's sitting in his kitchen. He flips over his um, coffee cup or his teacup, puts it on a breadboard, and he notices his hand starts just moving around. Like he's not thinking about it, but it's moving. So then he decides to put some letters and numbers on this breadboard, and it starts pointing out the letters. He says he takes this to E.C. Lesh and says, hey, you're my next-door neighbor as far as, like, offices. Uh, could you make me some of these? They make a dozen. The neighbors really like them. Charles Kennard's like, hey, we should go into business. E.C. Lesh is like, I, you know, I don't think so. I've got a really good business doing all these other things. You can make these at home. No one's going to buy them. But Charles Kennard sees the future. Mm-hmm. He, in 1890, he moves to Baltimore, meets a few more people, and they decide to start making these boards. And, and one night, in April of 1890, at a boarding house at the corner of Charles Street and Center Street in Baltimore, there's Charles Kennard, Elijah Bond, his business partner, who patents the Ouija board for him, and his sister-in-law, Helen Peters, who's seen as a, uh, a great medium at the time. And they ask the board what it wants to be called. And it spells out O-U-I-J-A, mm. a word they've never heard of. And they say, what does this mean? And the board spells out, good luck. So Ouija becomes the Egyptian luck board. Why Egyptian? Well, in 1890, there were all these discoveries in Egypt in the Valley of the Kings. To Americans, Egypt was mystical. Mm. And so it was perfect. So Ouija was born. And from there, um, William Fold was one of the original uh, employees, one of the original stockholders. And he ends up taking over the company uh, by 1893, or heading the company at least. And from then on, him and his family make the Ouija board starting in 1890 all the way to 1966 when they sell it to Parker Brothers. So the, the family, very important to the story. I was able to track those people down, and um, you know, a lot of those people are my really good friends. I consider them um, not just extended family, but family. You just can't be doing this this long and uh, not make some really good friends. Yeah, I was going to say that to- you were so into it that, that you know, getting a hold of family members and stuff, and they even uh, credited you as uh, kind of uh, stopping a so-called family feud too. <laughs> I mean, you've been to grave sites and and. <laughs> yes. You're really yeah. I'm totally yeah. I'm totally obsessed. Yeah, I'm gonna say that you said it for me. <laughs> well, as we as we kind of wrap this up, uh, I did want to mention once again that we encourage all of our listeners to see the film Ouija. And uh, one of the fun things that I enjoyed about. Uh, the film is that for people who maybe haven't had a chance to play the game, and I'm sure you probably helped in consulting for the film, they lay out the rules. So for our listeners who have never played or perhaps have played incorrectly, what are the rules to playing Ouija? Do not be nude if it's cold. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You, um, you know, so in the movie, uh, the rules are there's a little prayer um, or a little poem that they say in the beginning. And they move the planchette around the board. Um, they do a circle for every person who's playing. Mm-hmm. And one of the rules is never use it in a graveyard, never use it alone, and always say goodbye. And, and those are regestitions or urban legends that have grown up over time um, that have changed. It's, it's not always how people play the game. But, um, you know, after 
many different movies showed using it by yourself would cause possession. It, it's it's just creeped into our um, psyche. So yeah, the the Blu-ray and DVD come out um, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So everyone, if they can't go out and see it, they should definitely buy that. And for your listeners who really are into uh, the Ouija board. Um, me and my group, the Talking Board Historical Society, are hosting WeechaCon to celebrate this 125 years of um, history in Baltimore. Cool. Um, the city's involved, and uh, we're going to have speakers talk about, you know, from people who believe you're talking to demonic entities, the people who believe it's just completely your mind, and everything in the middle. It's going to be a good time. So if you're interested, you can look up WeechaCon or uh, go to TBHS. Org. And you got some Perfect. great websites up there too. And also, you can mention I, I seen it said being released. Uh, do you not have a book coming out? Yeah, where I'm working on a book with a, a good friend of mine, Brandon Hodge, um, kind of on the complete history of spirit communication devices, of which Ouija is clearly up there. Absolutely. And uh, you can tell me, I don't know, maybe you've changed the title, but from what I read, it's tentatively titled Talking Tables and Scribbling Spirits. You got it. Perfect. I just received a message from another world, and Lon Chaney Sr. <laughs> told me to tell your friends at Universal to not tear down the original Phantom of the uh, <laughs> Opera movie sets that they're going to be tearing down soon. Uh, just had to get that in. <laughs> no, what I, what I want to know, here's, here's my last question. So, Merch, if, if you and, and you know your husband, your family, whatever, decide you want to go out to dinner but you don't know where to go, do you like ask the Ouija board? Does it help you make decisions on a daily basis? <laughs> I, I would tell you, you know, look, okay, so, you know, not, uh, your real question is kind of like, right, like my house, yes, it's a huge museum to the Ouija board. It's crazy. It, it, it freaks out most Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, <laughs> seven dads, anyone who knocks on my door. Um, so, um, but the scariest things in my house are not the things that are that are on the walls. It's the people who live in them. <laughs> so, for people who are wondering what to be afraid of, probably more likely to be afraid of me than any of the stuff that's here. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, just, just to nail you to the wall for one second, I don't believe you quite sure. said if you believe you can talk to the dead or not. Yeah, I, no, I don't know. I, I want to believe. Like, I, am, I am as honest about this as I possibly can. Okay. I want it to work more than anything. I want to experience it. I, I sit through all of these Ouija sessions, which, by the way, they get a little boring. Like, I mean, there are people who, who wrote entire books one letter at a time with the Ouija board. Like, holy crap. Wow. Right? Like the, first, the first text messages came from the other side from the <laughs> Ouija board. But, like, I mean, even texting. Don't you get bored texting? Oh, oh yeah. Just pick up the phone. Like, oh, God, I just can't talk to them faster than this is going. Right. And so, you know, like, I'm sitting through all of those, and I want it to work. And I just haven't had that experience that has made it definitive. I have had experiences for the moments they happen where I'm 100% a believer. And then about five minutes later, my logical brain kicks in and sees about five different ways whatever happened could have happened. Mm -hmm. right. And so I don't know. And that's what keeps us playing. And again, the Ouija board is so simple. You can make this at home. Letters and numbers, nothing mystical about them. The Ouija board is unique because we give it power. Yeah. So... Like, we're on the phone right now, right? We get into a huge fight. We, we call each other names. We threaten each other. We hang up the phone. You don't take your iPhone, throw it out the window, and say, I'll never have another one of these in my house again. <laughs> but that, that happens with a Ouija board, and that's what you do. Because we don't want to take responsibility for the communication. Right. We put it on the board. The board is the bad thing. But look, this is plastic and cardboard today. Like, are you afraid of plastic and cardboard? But we're afraid of what it represents. Right. And so we say it's the bad thing. It's the problem. It's causing this. It's got a bad Not rap. The, it, it's got a bad mm -hmm. rap. I mean, it means good luck. How can it be totally evil? <laughs> well, you know, like, okay, so for all your listeners, they know this. What's a bad experience with the Ouija board? A bad experience in all my questions, because I collect all this stuff, is... Oh my God, I was playing with the Ouija board and it told me when I was going to die and how I was going to die. And I'll say, Oh my God, really? What did you ask the question? Well, we asked when I was going to die and how I was going to die. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay, like, I mean, ask for the lottery numbers for God's sake. I yeah. want the lottery numbers asked every time. And I still don't get them. So, I mean, you know, and the Ouija board, you think, would show me some love after all these years. Right? Well, you know, if you want to give a bad rap to the Ouija board, Universal showed us that if you could believe, you might be able to talk to the beautiful Olivia Cook, star of Ouija board. And that, that's all good to me, so. I would, 
You know what? I will say this. I got to meet um, in person um, Bianca Santos um, at the event. She was there. So it was it was wonderful. And yes. she is as beautiful oh, yeah. and smart and fun as you could possibly imagine. She, it, we came, we only came in third. We didn't come in fourth because of her. Mm. She figured out the puzzles way faster than any of us. Wow. So, uh, she was great. Far out. Now, if you would have had Lynn Shea on your team, you, you would have won. <laughs> we love it. She's been on the show. She's a great lady. She, Oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, I, yeah. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the air. We encourage our listeners, check out Merch's website. You can go to robertmerch.com. And also, of course, don't forget that Ouija is available on digital DVD uh, as of January 13th and Blu-ray combo pack, including Blu-ray, DVD, and digital HD with ultraviolet. Yeah, make sure you and get the DVD. it's on make demand sure. on February 3rd from Universal right. Pictures. Make sure you get the DVD if you want to see our guest uh, extras. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Uh, Merch, it's been so much fun having having you on the show thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me and yes you guys have fun with the movie it was it's a blast it yeah. absolutely is have a great rest of the weekend <laughs> you too take it <laughs> easy all right bye-bye